So I want to now move on to something slightly different. Uh, we're going to somehow see how some of the things from the Galois theory course uh, interact with our our algebraic number theory. So uh, I'm going to introduce, you don't need to know, I've known any Galois theory before, I'm going to introduce what we need. But essentially what we're going to look at is how different embeddings uh, move our prime ideals around and so on. And this will be quite useful because we'll be able to study uh, the next time like what primes ramify in our fields and we'll be able to understand uh, cyclotomic fields a lot better for, for it. So this, this section is called uh, embeddings and prime ideals. And I'm going to start with the definition which you would have seen if you've done Galois theory, but I may have not seen otherwise. So definition 3.6.1. This is as follows. I'm going to let uh, k over f be extension of number fields. Um, we say k is normal. Uh, sometimes also called Galois, if um, uh, normal over f, um, if every embedding uh, or I call this sigma from k into the, the complex numbers, uh, which fixes f, so the embeddings keep f uh, fixed, has image again in k. In other words, what does, it, what does this mean? Uh, I.e., we have um, I.e. So I.e. Sigma is an automorphism. Sigma goes from k to, to k, and it fixes uh, f. So it does nothing to the elements of f. Uh, this is what it means. So I'm saying embedding goes goes from k to the complex numbers, but if in fact the image isn't a random thing as well, isn't some different thing in the complex numbers, it is just the, the field k again, then, then I call, then if it, this happens for every embedding, then I call my field normal. So when you have these normal fields, the embedding somehow, um, <clears throat> you will see that this form a group, and this is what's normally called the, the Galois group. So let, let me give you, in, like in particular, in particular, yeah, if you have a, a field k, being like uh, Q alpha, and K contains contains all the conjugates of alpha. Um, then K is normal um, over Q. Normally, if I'll just say it's normal if I'm saying normal over over the rational numbers. If I need to specify it's normal over something, then I'll I'll say what the something is. So normally we'll say normal over over f. If f is q, I might just stop just saying over q and just say normal. Okay, so here's a, here's an example. Uh, the easiest one. Okay, uh, q square root two. Take f to be q. Um, this is normal as uh, any embedding sends, yeah, it was in root two to, to one of the conjugates, which is plus or minus root two, which is again in, in K. So you contain all the fields, so there's no, uh, nothing to worry about. So here's a, here's a non-example. In case it's not, keep this in more in view. A uh, non-example, if I took something like the cube root of two, then this doesn't work because one of the root, cube root of two, uh, taking the real root, there are two other uh, complex roots uh, of the same minimal polynomial. So some of the embeddings will move k from a real a field which is contained in the real numbers to a field which is contained in the complex numbers. Um, so it can't have been normal. Um, so, uh, this is not normal as uh, one of the embeddings, or I think two of the embeddings, um, 
one complex conjugate pair. It's two different embeddings. I will send say the cube root of two to sorry yeah it's the cube root of one cube root of two with theta three a cube root of unity. is a complex number. Um, so it can't be contained in K because this, this field is real and it's a complex. So, so the image of one of the embeddings isn't K, so it's this incomplete norm. So let me just set up some, uh, oh, before I set up some notation, let me just do a, I'll set up some notation that we'll use generally for, for these uh, normal fields, but let me just note that if we have a field which isn't normal, we can always make it a little bit bigger and make it normal. So. Proposition 3.6.4, that uh, K over F be a phi extension of a number field. Um, then there exists a phi extension. L over K, so I can make K in my top field a little bit bigger, um, such that L over F is normal, and L over K is normal. And this isn't so hard to prove, I'll essentially just tell you what the field is. Uh, if you, you know, by a primitive element theory, if K is as well as Q root alpha, then just set uh, L to be F and then I join all the conjugate roots. So alpha one, alpha N, where alpha I are conjugates. Of alpha. So I mean, sometimes it's called like the splitting field. I've taken my alpha, whatever the minimal polynomial is, and I've joined all the roots of that. So my my field now contains all the conjugate roots. So by what I've set up here, it's in particular, it means that now it's going to be normal. And checking that L to F and L to K are normal is going to be easy. Um, okay, so here's some uh, general notation that we're going to use throughout for these normal fields. So uh, I'm going to be talking about how these well, how these, and when you have a normal field, the embeddings form a group, but also how these embeddings also act on the ideal. So let me just set up some notation for this. So if k over f is a normal field, um, field extension, um, and you have some ideal, a and ok and ideal, um, and theta, an embedding of k. Um, I guess obviously, which in any case, which fixes fixes our ground field. So it's some automorphism. Then I'm going to let sigma acting on the ideal. What was sigma of a? I'm going to let this be the ideal generated by uh, images of elements in A under my embedding. All right, so I take my ideal A, I map all the elements to the side, and then just look at the ideal that that generates. This is what I'm calling uh, sigma A. Furthermore, um, I'm going to let this is notation from Gallo theory. Gal k over f uh, denote the set of embeddings. So first of all, I'm going to tell you, tell you in a second how this is actually a group. But denote the set of embeddings um, of k, which fix f. Um, now that the key thing is because this might be one is normal, these are actually automorphisms. So you can actually make this into a group. This isn't just a, a set of all the embeddings. This is actually a group. Uh, since k over f is normal, 
uh, we can make this into a group. But just using composition. Uh, so composition as our operation. Yeah, i.e. Yeah, sigma one times sigma two. Well, if I, I have two two things I want, these are two embeddings I want to apply it to some unknown to x, this is just sigma 1 of sigma 2 of x. Um, and you always have the identity embedding, so that's our identity element. And uh, you can actually check that this is going to form a group. Uh, I.e., uh, for sigma 1 to sigma 2 in the i. Now I'm going to call this a Galois group. Um, For this, so I'll say one checks this is a one can check. I encourage you to go check that, that this is a group. So I think of what the inverses are. Checks this is a uh, group, and we know how many embeddings we have of uh, an ex a field extension, you know, that fix f. So we know how many embeddings we have. We actually this was did this a long time ago, and so by proposition 1.5.8, we know that uh, there are only uh, yeah, k to f such embeddings um, so this Galois group has size uh, the degree of my field extension um, So this is uh, uh, this is the Galois. If you do the Galois theory course, or if you haven't done it, then in that course you study this group a lot more. You study its subgroups. Its subgroups somehow will course its normal subgroups will correspond to, to field extensions of your base field and, and so on. So it's a very nice correspondence. This is what you learn in the Galois theory course. But we won't really be using that. We're just going to use the fact that there is, in this case, if you have a normal field, the embeddings form a group, and we're just going to study how this group moves my ideals around. So I'm going to apply it to my ideal. And we're going to see what happens. So here's the um, the first theorem in this direction. So, um, 3.6.6. So now I'm going to take so k over f a normal extension. Um, of number fields. Uh, I'm going to let P and OF be a prime ideal. I may as well call this PF. PF and OF are a prime ideal. Um, and I'm going to take two ideals lying above it in OK. So I'm going to let P1K and P2K uh, in OK be prime ideals. Deals uh, above uh, my my ideal PF. So what's my um, what does my theorem say? Then first of all, oh maybe I should say uh, I'm gonna let sigma be an element of my Galois group. Sigma be in L K over F. Then first of all, sigma of P of F, um, sorry, not P of F, uh, P1 of K. Say P1 of K, if I take one of the primes uh, above it, um, it's again a prime ideal over my, my base one, so my, over PF. And moreover, I can always find, if I have any two prime, prime ideals over my, my bottom one, and find one element of my gallery which will move one to the other. Um, and moreover, there exists an element. I'll take this a name. I don't know. I'll just give it a name. Some, some element, sigma and gal k over f, such that sigma of 
have P1K is going to be P2K. So I have two ideals over my, my ideal here. So I'm just happy to switch it to here. I have DF. Here I have P1K. Here I have P2K. These are two ideals that lie above it. Here I'm in OK. Here I'm in OF. Um, what I've told you, first of all, is that sigma of P1K also lies above it. So the first thing on the theorem, but also um, my Galois group somehow will, will move them, to, will be transitive. So I can find an, a sigma which will send, so it's at sigma of phi 1, sigma of P1 of K will be P2 of K. So I can move this one to this one and, and in general. So this is sending a transit. Any two of the things that I pick, I'll be able to find some element which moves, them, moves one to the other. Um, okay, so here's the, uh, let me just put it in the box. So here's a proof. Um, so I'm just going to ease the I'm going to let G be this color group. Um, note that uh, since this P1K um, is a prime ideal, as I said, then we know that OK mod P1K is an integral domain. ideal. So uh, first, yeah, the first thing I'm trying to prove is, is this first statement that this again is a prime ideal lying over the same field. So I'm just going to first check it's a prime ideal. So just now apply sigma to this quotient to this OK mod P1K. Um, since, you know, since our field is normal, so since sigma of OK is going to be OK, um, we get OK mod P1 K um, is isomorphic to OK mod sigma P1 K. So if this is an integral domain, this is going to be an integral domain. Um, so we have that. Uh, it's again a prime ideal. So sigma P1 K is again a prime ideal. Um, so now we just got to check this. I said that it was some prime ideal over uh, PF. So now I have to check this bit. So moreover, uh, we know by definition, we know that P1K intersect OF is PF. This is what it means to be over, or lying over, over means. And we know that sigma and sigma fixes F. So if you just apply sigma to this whole thing, you get sigma p1 of k to set sigma of plus sigma pf. So this is something in f, this is something in f. So all of this thing that hasn't changed, so this is the same thing. So uh, you just get of and pf, so which implies that sigma p1 k lies over PF by definition. Okay, so now I just need to check my, my second claim, which was that if I, I can always find uh, some sigma, which will map one prime ideal lying over P to another one. Um, <clears throat> so let's just assume that this wasn't the case. So now, uh, uh, suppose that for all Sigma in G, uh, sigma of P uh, was oops, sigma of P one of K uh, was different from that be two of K. Um, then here's a trick. Let's use the Chinese remainder theorem. Then using the Chinese remainder theorem, or the three point three point twenty one, uh, we can find. find some alpha in OK, such that first starters, I can make alpha be congruent to zero mod uh, P1 of K. Um, and I can make alpha congruent to one. So not, I want alpha to be in this ideal P1 of K, and I can make it not be an ideal, so congruent to one, say, mod uh, sigma of P1 of K for all sigma in, in G. So, 
right, maybe sigma and g, uh, sigma different from the identity. Um, so now, uh, let's just consider the, the norm of this. So now, the norm from k to, to f of alpha uh, this, remember, this is this notation is going to be a product, product of all embeddings. So, this is, in this case, it's a product of all my elements of my color group, which are literally the embeddings uh, of sigma of alpha, which uh, by construction, this lives inside. Uh, Ah, sorry, I got this wrong. I got. Uh, this should be a two. Oh, and then yeah, this is. I don't need to put identity down. I'm assuming that this, this is for all. So, um, great. So, um, I know that this um. By construction, I know that this is in in this ideal, and it's not in all of these ideals. But in particular, one of the elements is in, when I put the identity, I get in this ideal. So the product. And there's one element in the ideal, so it's ideal. So this is in here, uh, which I'll remind you, this is just uh, PF by definition. On the other hand, um, alpha is not in sigma uh, P1K um, by construction. So if you look at, say, sigma of alpha to the minus one, this is clearly not in P1. Okay, this would apply the inverse to both sides. This, this makes sense. Uh, but notice that we have the following. Notice that the norm of k to q of alpha, well, I've just told you what this is. This is the product over sigma in g of um, sigma of alpha. But then this is a group. So this is the same thing as taking the product over the inverses in g of um, sigma of alpha inverse. Um, which is going to oh well, yeah, uh, which is going to give us a contradiction because I've just told you that this is not in none of these elements are in P one K, um, and yeah, so this gives a contradiction uh, since we just saw so the left hand side. Let me just write this out. And side uh, is in PF, um, but the right hand side uh, is not contained in P1K. No, none of these elements are in P1K, so this none of these things are in P1K. Uh, um, but yeah, we know that P of F is contained in P1 of K by lying above. So, um, this couldn't have happened. Cool. So now, let's look at some corollaries of this, uh, of this result, of the fact that we can move these two, move any two ideals together. So this tells us something immediately about what the possible ramification and residue degrees are, or like what happens to ramification and residue. So, so I'm gonna let, be in the same situation, KRF be a normal extension of number field. Um, and, yeah. and I'm going to let okay, P1, K, P2, K be um, two prime ideals over some prime a prime ideal uh, pf in of uh, then what does this tell me it tells me that the ramification degrees of you know, p1k over pf and the ramification of p2k over pf are the same and it tells me that the red, that same thing for the residue degrees. Cool. So, uh, because we can move them around, is, is the, that's a key thing here. 
So proof. So let's just start by factoring our prime ideal PF in our So uh, first factor abstractly uh, uh, PF in in LK. We have you know, by definition how we define these things. We have a PF OK is ideal. I'm just going to call it like this. Ah. Let's do this. The ideal, oh, this is going to make you think it's, it's principal. I don't want to do that. So again, this is the ideal generated by PF in OK. Um, this factor is a product over I of some beta I of K E to the beta I K over PF. This is how by construction, these EIs were defined explicit exactly as the ones that show up when you do the factorization. So now, by the previous theorem, 3.6.6, if we apply a sigma to this, uh, we get, what do we get? So we have this, this isn't going to change. This side is not going to change, but yeah. I'll just write it out. This is sigma PF. Okay. And this is product over I of sigma BIK E to the BIK over um, PF. Oh, maybe I should put, let's be precise. Well, no, the, 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 this, the power isn't going to change. So, so we have this. Um, but, uh, by the fact that we can, for any i and j, I can find a sigma which will send beta i k to beta j k, uh, and the uniqueness of factorization, we somehow get the result. So, but then, by the fact from the above theorem that for any, any i and j, we can find yeah, sigma in Galois group such that sigma of B i k is B j of k, uh, P j of k, um, and uniqueness of factorization. Uh, we get that these degrees have to be the same. E J K L P F for any i and j. So, so this is uh, all you want. So this is the first part. I've done the the E i s. Now let's do the residue degrees. Um, this one is still this is similar similar to the what well, we did in the first part of the proof of theorem of the previous theorem. So for the second part, um, we we know um, proof. Of three point six point six that OK mod say P one K is isomorphic to well, this is my why I defined to be my residue field so this is P one K so this is the notation I use little K of this um, but this is now going to be isomorphic to the other residue field uh, of sigma of P one K which you know, by definition remember is this OK mod sigma OK so th this automorphism my, my residue fields are exactly the same so if this if it's the same residue field then it will have the same residue degree uh, from which the result follows let's go back and look at what the definition of um, residue degree was and you'll see this um, and lastly, let me just finish on this other card, card 3.6.8. Uh, ambient integer. And uh, Z to N A. It's always going to be primitive. So when I say, when I write Z to N, I always mean primitive. And through to unity. Put this in practice. T, and I'm going to let, so look, consider the atomic field. K, Q, Z to N, 
and p a prime number, uh, then yeah, the prime the ideal generated by p is going to look like p1 to say pr all to some power e, where uh, these pi's are primes of OK uh, over P. P equals E of PI of P is a ramification degree. And they all have the same residue degree. And all these PIs have same residue degree. So in cyclotomic fields, um, I'm claiming that the factorizations always have a very simple form, that the residue degree is always the same, the ramification degrees are always the same. Uh, and the proof is just literally just noticing that this is actually, in this case, this, this field is normal. So proof, uh, this follows from the previous corollary, from corollary 3.6.7, and denoting that K over Q is normal. Um, if you contain one root of unity, then you contain them all, essentially, if you're primitive root of unity. Uh, great, so I'll leave this here. Uh, next time we're going to look at is how you can use this to study how what primes ramify in number fields. Um,